не, это не остановит. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amanda Peltier, and I am the Vice President of Education and Workforce Development for the Ohio Insurance Institute. Um, today, you're going to be hearing from three panelists who are going to talk with you about all the opportunities in the insurance industry and why you should consider a career in insurance. Um, before we get started with the introductions of the panelists, just a few housekeeping items. If you're not already muted, we ask that you please mute yourself. Um, and we also ask up in the top right hand corner of the screen, if you're not currently in speaker view, um, we would ask that you, you switch your view to speaker view so you're just seeing the person um, who is talking. And also related to the chat, um, feel free to at any time to post questions in the chat box. We received a lot of great questions ahead of time through the online form, but if time permits, we will try to work in some additional questions as well. Um, so before we get started, I would like to introduce the panelists as well as our moderator today. So our first panelist is Nicole Smith, and Nicole is a seasoned HR professional that has been in the insurance industry for eight years. She started her HR career in the U.S. Army, where she served as a personnel man management specialist, and she has over 10 years in the staffing industry and seven years as an HR generalist. She joined Grange Insurance in 2014 as their senior recruiter after having her own business, and she served on the board of directors, including president for the Human Resources Association of Central Ohio, and has been involved in other non-for-profit boards. She is passionate about connecting talent with career opportunities within the exciting and evolving world of insurance. Thank you, Nicole, for joining us today. And next we have Tyler Vaughn. Tyler is a, is a middle markets underwriter at Zurich North America. Prior to this role, he started his insurance adventure at the University of Akron as a founding member of the Risk Management Insurance Program in the university's Gamma Iota Sigma chapter. For those of you that might not know, GAMMA is the International Insurance Risk Management and Actuarial Science Fraternity. With his involvement at the University of Akron, Tyler interned as an Enterprise Risk Management and Property Casualty team member at CBiz. And following that internship, he was a small business underwriter with Westfield prior to his current role at Zurich. Tyler is a founding figure of Rising Risk Professionals of Northeast Ohio, he sits on the Insurance Industry Charitable Foundation's Associate Board, assists with leading the Cleveland Gamma Iota Sigma Alumni Council, and sits on the Board of Directors for Northeast Ohio's Risk Management, um, Insurance Risk Management Society. Looking into the future, Tyler is excited for other professionals to join this awesome industry. And our third panelist today is Jeremy Wittenbaum. Jeremy is a senior at The Ohio State University majoring in insurance. He began his insurance career at age 17, working for his family's independent agency, SP Agency in Cincinnati, Ohio. On campus, Jeremy is involved as vice president of Ohio State's Gamma Iota Sigma chapter. And to prepare himself for the, post, for the industry post-graduation, which for him will be in May, Jeremy has worked on the agency and company side and even recent, recently obtained his property and casualty insurance license. Um, and finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator, moderator and my colleague, Connie Fry. Connie retired in 2021 from Westfield Insurance after a 36-year career and currently works with us on the Insuring Ohio Futures Initiative. Throughout her career, Connie has been very active in the industry's workforce development initiatives and has served on the Risk Management and Insurance Advisory Board for several Ohio universities. So with that, I will turn it over um, to Nicole to start us out. Oh, and so excited to be here today and uh, definitely excited to share opportunities that um, are within the insurance industry. Many people think that, you know, when they think of insurance, maybe somebody coming in, knocking on your door and selling a life insurance or so much more than that. And we're all excited just to, you know, share with you some of um, our information and our experiences within the insurance industry and to have some open dialogue. 
I think I'll go next. Um, so to echo Nicole's point, that was definitely my thoughts on the insurance. And first uh, was exploring it at Akron that it's just selling door to door, but it is not that. So really <laughs> to talk with you guys today, feel free to interrupt us or use a chat function if you have any questions. Um, and I wanted to give a thanks to the OII for putting this together. I think during a pandemic, it speaks uh, volumes that they're still actively um, engaging, reaching out and doing things like this. So thank you all, both Amanda's, Connie, um, but yeah, excited to be here. Uh, thanks Amanda and thanks Connie for putting this on and um, for everyone for attending and taking time out of your busy day. Um, I'm excited to share some insight into um, some of my experience in the industry. Um, I began, like Amanda said, when I was 17, um, at my family agency, I was putting away the dailies and files, so it wasn't true insurance yet, uh, but that was a little gateway into where I've come, and I'm excited to share with you guys what, um, what we know. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Nicole, Tyler, and Jeremy. Appreciate you guys kind of opening things up and getting us started. Um, for those of you that have signed up and registered and have joined us for the webinar this morning, um, thanks to all of you because you did a great job of submitting questions and providing some of your thought leadership in those questions, kind of framing for us the things you're curious about or the things that you'd love to have our panelists talk a little bit more about. And they've, they've hit on some of it already. So I'm going to start us off and uh, Tyler, I'll ask you to, to start us off and then Nicole and Jeremy, please weigh in. Why should the insurance industry um, and the roles in our industry be attractive to today's college students? Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Connie. And I forgot to mention, I'm uh, battling a cold right now, so you're going to have to work with me here. But um, yeah, no, I think I think of one word when um, uh, asked that question, opportunity. When I was during, uh, during my college career at Akron, I um, got involved with the insurance industry because of the opportunity, different avenues. It's not just selling. It's not just underwriting. It's not just um, evaluating the risk. I think looking into the future, there's going to be even more opportunity, specifically for um, Ohio. I mean, in Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, wherever you sit, just with kind of where our industry is going with kind of the retirements we're seeing, the virtual environment. I mean, you can live anywhere in the nation, anywhere in the country and work for Westfield Insurance in Ohio. So really, I attribute the opportunity and I mean, we can make it fun. I think it's evolving every single day um, compared to where insurance was 50 years ago. Um, it's going to be totally different now and where we look into 50 years from here. So I think there's a lot of opportunity and we can make it fun. So I think that's definitely appealing and it's what we make it. So great. Thanks, Tyler. Jeremy, Nicole. Yeah, um, I can go next. So I have um, three things that I feel that um, makes the industry attractive. Um, number one is that it's stable. It's been around since 16, I think it was 1666 when the Great Fire of London occurred and um, it's not going anywhere. It's, it's you know, everyone needs it. Um, so that's that factor. Number two is there's a ton of opportunity, just like Tyler said. Um, I know uh, that Ohio is seventh in the nation for in terms of total insurance employment and second in the nation in terms of total PNC employment, which is amazing. Um, Ohio is growing, it's fast, Columbus is growing, uh, Cincinnati is a great city, that's where I'm from. Cleveland and uh, the three C's are a great combination and great cities to work in for the insurance industry. And um, thirdly, it is a uh, lucrative industry. So the average uh, annual salary of someone working in insurance in Ohio in 2020 was $86,100, uh, which is 55% higher than the average private sector worker in Ohio. And on the agency side, if you're a producer and you keep producing business, you know, sky's the limit. You can go anywhere. So that's what I feel like the, the three main points about our industry are and what makes it um, interesting to look into. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Nicole? And for, gosh, there's so much already said between uh, Tyler and Jeremy, which is awesome. I'll kind of go in a different um, angle. It's just the, the ability to truly have an impact on individuals. Um, you know, when you put yourself in a situation, if you have yourself experienced, you know, unfortunate car accident or 
work needing to be done on your home due to a storm or things like that. The ability to, you know, as Jeremy mentioned, stable industry, but definitely truly having an impact on people's day-to-day lives. And, you know, we are basically an industry that is, you know, based on a promise to deliver um, in, in a life event that occurs. So, you know, really just being able to have that um, impact, a diverse um, industry. It's, you know, very exciting when you look at our industry, you know, even 20 years ago and, you um, how how much that has really evolved, not only from, you know, the um, leaders and, you know, the skills that are brought in, you know, you may not have known this, but, you know, we have anything from software developers to, you know, certainly claims reps, um, you know, HR, finance, all those different majors that you're going to school for, are going to be found within the insurance industry. Um, and it's just exciting to be part of that. And, you know, particularly in Ohio, um, you know, where it is truly just with a strong presence in the insurance industry. And, you know, one of our um, uh, values is to do the right thing. And I think in the insurance industry, we all have so much pride for the industry that, you know, we are working in and knowing again, that you truly have an impact on people's lives daily. Thanks, Nicole. I, I appreciate too the statement that was made around the, the stability of the industry and, you know, the, the longevity of the industry. Um, I think it's interesting too for us to consider there's not a, a main transaction that happens without an insurance product buying a home, buying a car, starting a business. Um, we are right there in partnership with businesses and individuals and in some of the most critical and important investment times within their lives, as well as then there to help pick up pieces if a loss has occurred. So um, I appreciate those comments. Tyler and Jeremy, I'm gonna turn to you guys just a little bit on this next question that was posed. Um, looking at, you know, small independent agencies, large companies, the whole industry, taking all of that into account. Can the two of you kind of share a little bit about what your journey was when you considered a career choice and you really said, yes, property casualty, this is where I'm headed. That's the workforce I want to be a part of. What are two, of the three, two or three of the things that you considered as you were making that, that commitment and that decision? Jeremy, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, um, so number one was the ability to be able to join my family agency and family business that um, has really had an impact on me within the last three years. Um, being able to work with my dad, my uncle, my grandpa, my grandma, who still go in every day, which is amazing. Um, it's, it, it puts, I call it intrinsic motivation, where it's love for the work itself, not for the benefits, not for the money. It's it's because I truly love the work and I love working with family and I am obviously biased, but family businesses are, I feel like the best in um, the world. Number two was to um, provide financial stability for um, hopefully in the future for me and my family. Um, as I said before, it's a very lucrative industry, um, especially on the agency side where you can just build up your book of business and um, go, go, go. But that is my second point. And then thirdly, I would say that uh, the impact I would have on others is the reason why I got into it. The industry is very producer driven and the fact that, you know, people don't know what they're buying. You know, I see, I see it come in every day through leads to the agency, but people don't understand what, what liability coverage is. They don't know what collision, what, what other than collision, you know, what roadside, what transportation expenses and all these different coverages that no one would know because they don't teach you that as you grow up. But that would be my third point is that um, it, it allows me to impact the lives of others and help them find the right coverages and, and needs that fit their specific uh, portfolio. Yeah, and to follow um, Jeremy's points, I would say, so I attribute my path, the start of my path to Dr. Jill Bisco at the University of Akron. She has so much passion for this industry. There was no risk management insurance program or uh, Gamma Iota Sigma chapter when she started there. It was her dream, uh, her, her motivation, her 
drive that really got us to where we were at as with Akron's program. So me personally talking with her more, I like to stay curious. So really the continuous learning opportunities. I did a job out of college that I was going to do the same thing every day on the desk, um, now in a virtual setting by myself in my apartment um, all day long, every day. So really, I mean, on the underwriting side, being an underwriter, you control your book, what you're going to write, evaluating the risks. Um, I'm curious on just learning about different risks every single day that comes in, rather it be a manufacturer or um, healthcare, something like that, looking at apartments. So with that, I mean, that was huge to me, staying curious, the continuous learning aspect, the support for continuous learning that I learned that all these companies um, really have gone for them. And then also at the same time, I wanted a job after college. Not everyone has a job, especially focus in their major, um, graduating from four, five, six years, however um, long it takes you to, to graduate. So that was something that I mean, Akron, when I was there, had a 100% job placement rate for our risk management insurance program. So that was huge to me to just know I had a job lined up, something to look forward to and not a job that I'd just be stable at. Um, and there's just to touch on, like I did earlier, the opportunity. So just to look into the future and know that I could go somewhere and it's in my in my control and my own uh, in my own boat. So. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate that. I think for many of us, um, a neat part of the industry is, is in fact the helping others, that being a part of um, a tough time for someone and, and helping them through that. Uh, but another motivator can often be that opportunity to be curious, like Tyler spoke to, and to just continually learn. So one of the coolest parts of our industry is we never know it all. Um, and about the time we think we might know it all, um, the product changes or the coverage form changes or the approach to that part of the business may change. So it's always dynamic. It's always, it's always growing and developing. And, and for many of us, that was an attraction point to the industry. So thank you, Jeremy and Tyler, for those, for those comments. So I know on that journey, uh, Jeremy, you're, you're most recently on the collegiate journey. You'll soon be graduating from the Ohio State University. And Tyler, you're just two or three years out from University of Akron, think back to internships. Um, we had a question that was posed about how did you go about looking for and finding your internship opportunity? And then Nicole, for you, a follow-up on that is what really helps the candidate to get that internship experience or get that internship role? Um, Tyler, I'll, I'll start with you. Let's talk internships here for a minute or two. Yeah, absolutely. So I look back to where I was at, what, four years ago, junior, junior year of college when I was looking for that summer internship prior to senior year. And I used to get so nervous to go to career fairs to um, just be proactive about asking for opportunities. But once I got kind of in my head that that's where my future is going to lie and go to these career fairs, get an internship and really control in myself that when you have an internship, it's all for you, not just for the company. You're assisting with projects, different um, Sorry, I think it muted me. I apologize. But um, I was just saying it's really a chance when you have an internship to learn what you want to do for the rest of your career. I mean, so kind of my path, I... I went in as an enterprise risk management intern at CBiz. So went through their 2018 summer internship program. Then I stayed on with them um, during my senior year and really assisted on the property and casualty side. So I kind of had the um, exposure to the broker relationships, uh, customer broker transaction. And then I didn't really have too much experience on the carrier side. So underwriting, what does that entail? What all goes into underwriting a policy? So that's really what drove me to join Westfield following my graduation due to that curiosity factor that, okay, I dipped my toes in ERM or um, the property and casualty broking side, agency side. So really, I mean, the career fairs um, really pull from advisors that you have. So advisors, not even just specific to risk management or insurance at these different colleges or in your department of finance or um, college of arts and sciences, anyone I mean, it's word of mouth a lot in this industry, I would say. I mean, if your advisor or a professor of yours knows that you're looking for an internship, they, I'm sure they know many people in that um, surrounding area that if they hear, okay, 
um, say Westfield Insurance is looking for an intern, they're going to recommend you. So I think really pull from that, pull from your um, all the contacts that you have. Going off of what uh, Tyler said and pulling off your connections, that's a, that's a great point. Um, my internship with Berkeley One, I actually got um, through LinkedIn. So in my 2292 um, business ethics class, I learned that you can go on LinkedIn and go to a company and search by um, what college each person went to. So I went to Berkeley One, I looked up who went to Ohio State, and lo and behold, there was one person that came up, and it was Francis, who at the time was or, yeah, at, at the time was our national sales leader, now leads the underwriting and sales teams. And I, I just blindly reached out to her saying, hi, Francis, uh, my name is Jeremy Wittenbaum, I'm interested in insurance. And funny enough, my family agency actually represents Berkeley One, so that's how that connection came into contact. And I said, I already know how to use your system and um, had two interviews with them. And I got the job and I went to Chicago in summer of 21 and currently still working remotely for them during the school year, um, which is awesome. But LinkedIn is probably the biggest tool that I would recommend using. Um, you can find anyone, anything, and it takes maybe a couple minutes to reach out to someone that you don't know. And just make that extra effort to put your foot in the door. Um, Francis actually told me um, when I left Berkeley and when I left their Chicago office to, to come back to school for my senior year, I asked everybody, I said, if, if you were 20 years old again, what is one thing that you would tell yourself and why? And she told me to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. So taking those risks, taking those opportunities, putting yourself out there, um, because if you don't, you may regret it and not know what opportunities you may be able to go in and seek in the end. But I would say that LinkedIn is truly one of the best places to go and find opportunities um, in the insurance industry. And I'll go at it from an employer's uh, perspective. It truly is music to my ears when I hear Tyler and Jeremy talk about their networks and really utilizing the networks and the technology. Um, because on the other end, as a recruiter, I certainly utilize that. Um, I can't even begin to tell you how many people I've connected with, whether it's going to school events or, you know, Gamma Iota Sigma events, different things where I've connected. And then when a full-time opportunity comes up or an internship that I'm like, oh my gosh, I connected with this person and I'm going to reach right out to them. So absolutely um, from all angles, utilizing your network, doing your homework, identifying, you know, eight to 10 key organizations that you have an interest in and really kind of focus your time on that. Do the research, get to understand a little bit about the company culture. What is their commitment to their community? Um, you know, kind, do they have a diverse slate of leaders within their organization? Really kind of hone in on that. Um, and then definitely making sure that you have mentors, um, you know, from <laughs> inside insurance, outside of insurance, all different sets. Um, you know, there is nothing as a better honor for somebody who's been in their career for a long time to have somebody new in their career to be able to reach out and say, hey, I really would like to have you as kind of a sounding board, being able to bounce ideas off, get your thoughts and expertise. Um, so don't be hesitant. I know some individuals when they're starting early in their career, they're like, oh, they don't have time to do that. Again, there's not a better honor there. So, you know, definitely would encourage that. And again, that's just building your network um, more and more, but definitely doing your homework and utilizing the network. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, that, that is music to my ears because there is nothing more joyful um, as a seasoned member of the insurance industry um, than when I have the opportunity to mentor someone else, um, you know, whether that's in a career decision or a project that they're working on. Um, there's, there's great joy in that. Uh, I think another really important port, point about internships is keep in mind those of you that are with us who are students, the experience of the internship is important. It might not be the best experience every time, 
but take away what you can learn from it. And remember, an internship is usually 10 weeks or 12 weeks or something part-time. If you find out that it's a role you don't enjoy, you've not put yourself in a full-time position that you feel like you can't exit easily. So you may learn what you don't want to do in an internship, and that can be a very, very valuable lesson to walk away with. So we've talked a little bit about internships. We've talked a little bit about the industry. Here in Ohio, we're blessed to have about 250 insurance companies across the state, big, small, all sizes, um, local, domesticated, all kinds of different opportunities in, in the insurance industry here in Ohio. So let's talk a little bit about what some of those roles might look like. In the opening comments, Jeremy and Tyler both mentioned that they, you know, not everything is sales, not everything is underwriting, not everything is adjusting a claim. So what other than sales can we share with our audience in terms of early career opportunities that may exist across the industry? I'm finishing college. I want to get a, an early to career role. What might I look at if I'm not thinking that I want to go into sales? And then again, Nicole, kind of to you is from a recruitment perspective, what are some of the things that I could do as a candidate to really help improve my chances to get those roles? So Jeremy, you want to start us off on this one? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And as Tyler hit on in his intro, he said that there's numerous other fields that you, that you can go into within insurance. Um, just at Berkeley One, I, there's underwriting, sales, marketing, distribution, um, there's a million different places. There's IT that you can go into. And I feel like that's where you get the, di the, the diversity of the industry is through that. You know, it's on, on TV, you see the, you see the, the gecko that saves you 15% or more. You see the, the, the Aaron Rodgers just kind of double check. And um, that's not what insurance is all about, which is the sad part is that they've ingrained into young people's minds that insurance is all about sales, it's all about price. It's it, that's not it. That's, not even close to what insurance is. Um, and there's so many other great opportunities in the industry. Um, I, I had the pleasure of working with the marketing team over the summer. So I got to work with in, within the, the Google ad department and I got to bring that experience back to my family agency and, and um, utilize that. I got to work with underwriting and I'm currently helping them out with the, the renewal underwriting where I can literally go and look at accounts and underwrite them from a standpoint of are they still meeting our guidelines at, at renewal? Is, did, did they have a loss? If, if so, uh, for example, if it was not a loss or they had fault, you know, just re-look re at the whole account. And I find that very interesting um, that there is a back-end underwriting. I didn't know that that was a thing until a couple months ago. Um, but there's just so many avenues that you can go to and so many other things that you can learn. I, I wish that I could go work in claims. I wish I could go work in risk management and, and learn more about that. But um, obviously you can't know everything in this industry. There's a million things to learn as we all know, but there's just so many routes you can take and so many different things you can learn. And that's what makes it fun. Absolutely. So many different avenues. And so mine personally, since I had that enterprise risk management exposure, the PNC broker agency exposure, I started at Westfield and their underwriting training program. It was actually called GDP, Graduate Development Program. Fun fact, Connie was in that when it was called, I believe, maybe Underwriting Basics or something like that, but um, at Westfield. Is that what company it was? Basic, company Basic School. There we go. <laughs> company Basic School. So, I mean, and with that, it wasn't focused on just underwriting. So we had claims individuals. We had surety individuals. And really, on the carrier side, you have personal lines and commercial lines. So me, myself... Um, I was more curious in the fact that I wanted to explore the commercial line. So businesses um, from restaurants to large manufacturers to apartment complexes, but you can also take a route in personal line. So if you're looking at even high net worth homes or autos, things like that, that's on the carrier side, but I didn't have to start on the carrier side. Like Jeremy is kind of uh, talking about, he is going to start on the carrier side, but his family is an agency. So you could assist at an agency and um, or a broker. So large brokers like Aon, Marsh, um, uh, Willis, all those large brokers you could start. I mean, it really depends on where your interests lie, where your personality fits, because I mean, if you're, if you're sales focused, if you're a go-getter, if you want to go, 
Not that you're not going to um, utilize that on the carrier side, but if you want to be out in front of people um, past COVID or pre-COVID, um, maybe the broker side is for you. If you're excited and you want to do that, where I wanted to have more of a technical analytical mindset, underwriting these risks, and really these underwriting training programs, they're known in the industry with say nationwide, Westfield, Travelers, wherever you, wherever a large carrier is, they most likely have an underwriting training program. So you can learn a lot through there. You can start on the broker side. It's not just sales. If you want to do sales, that is an opportunity. Kind of like what Nicole said earlier, you could go into IT, you could go into tech, you could go into marketing, kind of like what Jeremy said. It's not just the insurance function. So a lot of opportunity with these uh, insurance companies. And then from my perspective, so it's interesting, I'm definitely on the further end of my career and was never in an insurance industry. But when I had my own business, um, Grange actually was one of my clients and just loved the individuals that I worked with when I was, um, you know, partnering with them through my business. And I was like, gosh, I was like, this is such an amazing company. If you ever have a recruiter, position, you know, I can't imagine the size of the organization not having a full-time recruiter, but if you do, let me know. And that wasn't even what I did in my career. Um, I did a little bit of recruiting, but <laughs> so it was interesting that that actually ended up evolving in a four-year partnership and ended up uh, closing down my business and starting with Grange. And um, actually two of my three kids, um, I didn't force them, but I highly encourage that post-graduation, they go into the insurance industry and they both did. Um, so it was a great experience for them. They ended up moving into healthcare, but it was a great experience um, for them. And one of them also had an internship, but just, you know, if you even look at our job board from billing and accounting specialists to senior marketing, um, strategists to, you know, underwriting um, on both personal lines and commercial lines claims, there is just an unbelievable amount of opportunity. And the thing that I love probably most about the career track is you have so much relevant skills that can transfer from one role into another. So, you know, it's really cool. Maybe you know, your major is in finance and accounting. Um, and so maybe you're starting, you know, as a enterprise risk management um, specialist or something like that. You can take that skill set and move, whether it's in product or, you know, in uh, merging technologies, continuous improvement. There are so many opportunities. And the thing I love personally is even though, yes, my job from, you know, eight years ago to now, even though technically on paper, it's the same, right? Attracting top talent into the organization. Oh my goodness, has it evolved? Um, and what I did almost eight years ago is completely different than, you know, what I'm doing right now, even though it is still to attract that top talent and build networks, but it has just evolved so much. And the thing that I also love is, you know, really the majority of positions that I'm working on are due to um, growth and new headcount or due to internal promotions that we're needing to replace for or retirements very little is actually due to turnover. And I think as an industry, just in general, we definitely have a lower turnover. I know even in kind of the great resignation period, we're at less than 10% uh, turnover still as an organization, which is just phenomenal. Another cool thing is, you know, this, the last couple of years have been really rough. And for even us as a company, we've been around since 1935. Last year was the most profitable year that we have ever had in history. Where else are you going to find that kind of track record in the insurance industry, right? It's it's always going to be there. There is definitely a level of stability. Now, obviously, you know, storms and things like that can affect 
overall, but it's just an exciting um, industry to be in and really for you to be able to kind of align your passions and your values into an organization that really allows you to illustrate that on a daily basis. And who says insurance isn't fun? Just the passion and excitement that, that comes through from, from Jeremy, Tyler, and Nicole, um, I think really helps to show that. Um, I, I think an important point, and Nicole, you, you were just making this point, there is an opportunity once you've entered into the industry um, to do a wide variety of different things. It, truly, a career can be a ladder, that vertical ladder, I want to go up, 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 and I want to stay in a particular um, discipline, whether that's commercial underwriting or claims management or whatever that might be. But there's also an opportunity to take the, the knowledge and skills that you build and just create a matrix of, of different roles and share your knowledge and skill in different ways, whether within a particular company or agency or across the industry by changing companies or changing agencies and navigating that career path in, in your own unique and different way. Um, the other reminder that I would share is in our industry, we all have some of the same foundational needs that other industries would have. Like if we were a manufacturing operation, we would need an HR department and probably some IT folks and maybe some legal representation. Well, our industry needs all of that as well. So often for students, we will we'll, we'll share with them that whatever your major or minor is, chances are there is a role in the insurance industry that you would fit beautifully into um, and feel challenged and rewarded um, throughout your career. So, you know, if you're a, a pastry chef, um, there's companies who hire hospitality folks and foods, you know, food services, chefs, executive chefs, PGA professionals, um, lawyers, uh, HR professionals, IT professionals, project managers, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and Nicole mentioned there are roles that five years ago we weren't hiring for because they didn't exist. So for Jeremy and Tyler and, and many of you who are on the webinar as students, there are roles that you'll be in five years from now that don't exist today. So um, we can't necessarily tell you exactly what those positions might be, but we can tell you that the industry continues to share that we have across the U.S. about 400,000 jobs that are going to need to be filled in the next five to 10 years. So it's abounding with opportunity, um, and we're excited for you to take, take a look at the industry. So kind of on the tail of all of these different roles, an interesting question was posed by one of our students that's um, on the webinar, they've noticed and have been watching the actuarial field. Um, so our, our mathematician friends, our statistic friends, uh, very important to us as they're helping us with rate making and things of that nature. But they, their observation is the actuarial field has gotten very competitive. Um, they're wondering how can they make themselves stand out is that observation of competitiveness being seen by others? So Tyler, I don't know if you've seen anything related to that in your journey so far. And Nicole, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well as a, re a recruiter. Yeah, I just have to say, I respect actuaries so much. I could not do my job without them. I couldn't answer half the questions without them. I personally could never be an actuary because with math, it's just, it's amazing what they do. So um, what I would say, I have, a, I have a, a, a friend from the University of Akron. She, um, when you want to stand out in the actuarial field, I kind of asked her this question back when we were junior seniors in college because I didn't have too much understanding on that. And her, her kind of avenue, what she did to stand out were passing exams or even just studying for exams. I think just being proactive and letting the company know that, hey, I'm studying for these now. I'm looking to pass these in the future. Um, I'm not sure if I think she had like one or two exams, maybe three pass while um, prior to joining the company she's at now. But also at the same time, I think she had like two or three different internships. So with that, I mean, you, you don't only need to have an internship or don't feel limited to only that summer before senior year. I mean, honestly, all these internships are getting paid. So prior to sophomore year, um, you, you can always reach out to companies. Hey, can I do it in the spring semester or the fall semester of the school year. I mean, they're going to work with you. And like Connie said, there are so many jobs to be filled. And that's just exciting to me because 
Um, it's kind of what we make it. I mean, the pandemic has forced um, virtual um, working things like that. Moving forward, it's what we make it, a hybrid approach or whatever works best for you. So I think that that coincides with um, internships as well. I mean, and I know from some of the different leaders here in Columbus or Cleveland, there's so many internships out there. So I think that's really, I mean, you take advantage of um, two internships or one internship, you're passing some exams. I think you're going to stand out. I mean, if you're involved in like Gamma or any other type of organizations internally at your school as well, I think um, your resume is going to be towards the top of, your, top of the list. That's just my opinion. I'm sure Nicole has a great um, kind of perspective on that as well, because I'm sure she's looking at those resumes. So. Absolutely. So I can, everything that you said, Tyler, I agree with. And what I'll share with you is actuary definitely is a very competitive field from not only internship, but for full-time opportunities. And many of the things that Tyler already talked about, kind of getting involved, um, whether it's in your actuary club at your school, Gamma Iota Sigma, taking on some kind of leadership role, getting involved in, because what I really look for is somebody that's very well-rounded, um, whether it's for intern or full-time. I mean, I love obviously having a very high GPA and having a couple exams under your belt, but I find just as much value in your level of overall engagement and involvement outside of just the academic side, right? Because that's really going to be important in the workforce and being able to work collaboratively with a variety of individuals and communicating and things like that. So it really is kind of being well-rounded. Um, for us, we actually recruit much earlier for actuaries for internships than any other internship opportunity. I don't normally even post our normal internship opportunities until either end of December, early January. And um, for actuaries, I actually start working with the schools um, in June and July timeframe. We start uh, posting and interviewing in September, October with the plan of a November offers um, being finalized for the following summer for the internship. So, but before Thanksgiving, we've got all our interns identified in the actuary space for the following summer. Um, we do pay them a little more on a premium than we do our other internships. And, you know, just so you know, that is huge for us to be able to, um, you know, build a pipeline, right? Because, you know, again, they have to have a really positive internship experience to want to come back, but we have many that'll stay on part-time after their internship and work when they can. Um, and then definitely it's very common, two to three offers a year I'm making in, you know, the late end of the year for somebody who's going to be graduating in May or, grad, or offering in May for a December grad. So, you know, we have strong success in that. And many of our leaders actually started out in an internship role and now are, you know, AVPs or, you know, even higher leaders in the organization. So um, some of the things getting involved when there's an opportunity that you hear of, particularly an actuary, that an employer is going to be present, whether it's attending uh, one of your actuary club meetings, Gam Iota Sigma events, um, coming on campus for different things, check it out. It gives you some knowledge, but it also gives you just experience. Maybe this isn't a company you're interested in, but it gives you some experience and exposure and really getting to understand a little more. And then again, it all goes back to networking and doing your homework when it's time for you to look at those opportunities. But yeah, um, I, I will tell you for us, just in general, our internships, kind of sophomore, junior year are our main sweet spots as far as for hiring interns. However, I hired somebody um, in our enterprise risk management that was dual senior in high school and also enrolled in college. Um, so that was the youngest that I'd ever, and then occasionally we will hire somebody who has graduated, 
it just, that creates some challenges because we can't always guarantee something after the internship program. I'm going to jump back in because I love how Nicole brought up getting involved with gamma events or clubs. We, we're kind of um, giving this advice of do this, do that, but don't think that's a burden. These are so much fun <laughs> conferences you can go to. Um, I mean, some of my best friends now are, are from the industry, from these industry events. I mean, and like kind of Nicole said, I mean, putting, I mean, some of the different conferences I went to in Chicago or San Antonio, Florida, Atlanta, um, all around the country, if you put those on your resume as well, it kind of just shows you want to take that next step to network, to further your knowledge, to do whatever you kind of want to do. And something else I wanted to point out is she mentioned being well-rounded. I, I attribute that back to my junior year, even senior year self. I didn't have that 4.0 GPA and I was kind of discouraged about that. I was like, oh, I'm not going to get an internship. I'm not going to get an offer from Westfield. But then you prove yourself in other ways. I mean, staying involved, doing extracurricular. And then at the same time, if you have a story for where you're at, um, regardless of what you've been through or kind of the, the um, classes you've taken, I think that speaks volumes as well. Thanks, Tyler. I think those are, those are very important points. And related to the actuarial uh, field itself, keep in mind, one of the most burgeoning and growing areas in our industry right now is data analytics. So oftentimes an, an internship or an, an early to career role in something more data analytics related might work well for that individual who aspires to become an actuarial fellow, but still has additional exams to take and you know, additional steps to get to that point. So I think our industry offers alternatives that our actuarial uh, students could also look at and still be very highly contributing in, in, in the industry and in our, in our organizations. I'll also build on the comment Tyler made about gamma iota sigma and the ability, opportunity, I guess, and ability to attend conferences, yes, virtually over the last couple of years, but those types of things are by far the best networking opportunity that a student would ever have in their collegiate career. Our industry, as many of us know, is built on relationships and we'll find that it's very tight and we all know someone who knows someone and we're just a couple of people away from one another. Um, if you're uncomfortable as a student stepping out into the career fair, stepping out into the networking opportunities, join your Gamma chapter at your campus. Let Gamma help you do that. Um, because you will meet people outside of your chapter and outside of your school. And as Tyler just said, they will become lifelong friends. They will become colleagues from other companies or other agencies that you can reach out to and ask a what if or, hey, I need some help type questions. Um, let Gamma, let your campus involvement help you learn how to network so that you can leverage your network to the best of your ability throughout your career. Nicole, I'm going to pose one more question to you while we're kind of on the, the discussion of internships and we're talking about actuarial science, we're talking about all of these different roles. One of the questions that was submitted was, hey, in the insurance industry, what's the position on hiring international students uh, with a bachelor's degree? Um, and if so, are companies doing that? Do I have an opportunity as an early to career individual who's an international student? I know this can be a bit of a a stumbling block from time to time. So I thought I would just open up some conversation with you on that topic. Absolutely. Um, this is something that has definitely been on our forefront and some discussions, particularly over the last couple of years. We have a very strong commitment to really attracting and retaining a diverse uh, workforce. So, you know, with that, obviously this is one of the components. Um, what I'll share with you is like within our internship this summer, we have two individuals that are CPT. Um, and so we're working with them to get all their paperwork with their school and everything wrapped up. Um, as it relates to in a career, um, I will tell you, it is a more challenging because in order for us to get sponsored, so we're limited on employer, how many sponsors we can do in an annual basis. Um, and where we typically find that we need more of the international sponsorship type roles is 
in specialized skills, such as like ETL developers, um, guide wire developers, um, maybe in uh, security risk um, and cybersecurity, things like that. I'm not saying we've not done that at an entry level in the past, but it is very limited just because, again, uh, by the Department of Homeland Security, we only have a set amount um, of sponsorships that we can do as an employer um, on an annual basis. And also, to be frank, they're very costly. Um, you know, on average, you know, it's going to be when it's all said and done, it's about 18 to 20,000. Um, for each hire, and it can be more than that too, but depending on the situation. So we just have to be somewhat limited. But I would certainly say explore opportunities. Um, quite honestly, uh, some companies that are bigger than us. Um, so we're about 1,300 associates. So I think on average, I see about 12 to 14 sponsorships annually. Um, you may want to also check out some of the bigger organizations at, like Nationwide, um, you know, some of those that have a larger um, appetite, right, for additional sponsorships just to, you know, get that experience and be able to have a company that can support that. But I'm not discouraging from applying for positions because there are times where we can do that as well. But just know it's a pain for the employer side, a pain point for us. And it's something we're committed to trying to continue to build that bridge to be able to um, offer more opportunities when needed for that too. I appreciate your insight there, Nicole. I think too, sometimes the more global the reach is of the company, the more opportunity there may be for sponsorship for um, full-time international students to join those organizations. So I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit on this next question. And uh, Jeremy, I'm gonna start with you on this one. We've talked about all this opportunity in the industry and that there's so much for, you know, to, to offer to students. The college students don't think about us. College students don't think about our industry. They don't think about the RMI major in many cases until someone talks to them about it or shares their experiences. If we're at a university, some of our university partners that are participating here today, what can we do to educate and assist universities as they're guiding students with their career decision or their majors and minor decision um, to, to have them help students look at our industry? How can we help them help us? Um, great question. Um, first, I would say that we would need to uh, push more the insurance risk management actuarial science major itself. Um, for example, in my capstone class right now, in the first week, you know, my, my professor said, who in here is a finance major? Raise hands. Who in here is a marketing major? Raise hands. Who in here is an accounting major? Raise hands. Didn't even mention insurance. So me and my buddy who I was sitting next to, who's one of the one of the only two, probably six of us here at Ohio State, just kind of just kind of laughed. But um, I would say getting more um, pushed through the at Ohio State to the finance department. So that's where I would say to reach out to and get more involvement there. And number two, I would say would be to push students to um, to, to game IO Sigma. You know, there's a hundred plus chapters across the nation. I think there's even a couple in, in Canada now where, you know, I was at the, the regional conference. It was actually in Columbus here. And that's where I met you, Connie and Amanda. And um, there were at least a hundred plus insurance students there. And even though it was in Columbus, there were only, it was just Brooke and I, our, our current president. So that was um, not, not, currently ideal, but they're like, for example, Temple University, they had like 40 students there. It was, it was crazy. They were all insurance based, all risk management based. Um, there's another college uh, called Olivier College, which is a very insurance specialized college that brings out a, a, a ton of um, talent. But a game out of Sigma is where I would put the majority of my time. That's the true pipeline for um, insurance professionals. And um, Brooke and I, so when I was at Ohio State in my freshman year in 2019, um, there were only about 10 of us in the chapter and the majority of them were seniors. And uh, Alex McMullen, the uh, past president who actually came and spoke to our chapter last night, 
uh, put Brooke on to the, uh, to the board and Brooke is a, a year ahead of me. So she reached out to me next semester and said, Hey, you know, I'm trying to revamp this club. We were the alpha chapter. We were first on Ohio state back in 1966. Will you help me? And I said, heck yeah. You know, if anything insurance related that we can help to bring back the club and bring back insurance here on campus would be huge. Um, my, my professor of my PNC class and my employee benefit class, he was a part of one of the founding members of the uh, Archie Griffith Foundation here in Columbus. Um, and that's another huge, like Columbus is a very historic city for insurance. And I feel like we, especially in Columbus, need to focus on getting the major at Ohio State revamped. And um, we're up to now, I believe, 60 members at our Gamma Eta Sigma chapter here on campus, which is fantastic. And um, I can't thank Brooke enough. I, she was on this call earlier, but she's she and I have done a great job getting people back up and um, putting more word out that this industry is booming, ever-changing, everlasting, and um, there's a ton of opportunity. And I think that's what changes the game, putting the word out. I mean, just knowing that um, insurance is out there, I think, I mean, looking back to even from two to three years ago, the RMI programs now across the country, um, universities are adopting them every day. Um, and I know that because these gamma chapters are rising and um, coming to be at these different universities. So I think it's exciting and it's, it's totally true. Nicole, any thoughts on this one? You wanna weigh in or? Yeah, so it's interesting when Jeremy mentioned that I'm actually gonna be going to OSU and meeting with the Gamma Iota Sigma chapter um, April 19th. So hopefully to uh, see you there as well. But uh, yeah, it's kind of a two-way street, right? Because I love getting involved in the different Gamma Iota Sigma chapters, getting to know um, the individuals, the students, kind of finding out not only what their background is, but what are they passionate about? And, you know, really getting to develop a relationship with them. And again, from a recruiter perspective, I have kind of the old electronic Rolodex file when I'm like, okay, I know we have this role that this person would be perfect for. I'm going to go ahead and reach out to them. Sometimes it can be two years later um that that happens but you know again my job is kind of like this a puzzle finding the right person the right opportunity at the right time um so it really is about building those networks staying connected getting involved any ways that you can um on campus and off campus for those networking opportunities and from employer perspective we are definitely looking at ways that we can actually sponsor students. Um, I know that other companies have done that and we haven't um, participated in that, but for them to be able to attend those conferences too. So that's something we're looking at um, in the fall to do as well. So, you know, definitely getting that experience and involvement. We've all been there and, you know, it, it really does take a village and utilizing those networks and continuing to build those. Yeah, I appreciate those comments, Nicole. I, I think it's important too to remember, you know, our, our university partners need our help to come to them and, and share the stories and, and talk with their students. So sometimes it, it may be beneficial to chat with someone in career services, not so much from a recruitment perspective, but to help them make recommendations to the undecided freshman that's, you know, just joining the college of business and isn't real sure what they might want to do and hadn't thought about the industry and hadn't looked at the risk management and insurance major. So um, I, I think there are many, many ways that we as industry professionals can help our university partners by stepping out and saying, I'm willing to share my story or I'm willing to spend some time with a group of students, whether it's a gamma chapter or a finance club or whatever it might be, just, just to talk and, and begin to help them create their network. Um, I see we did have a comment. Thank you, Adam. Um, it, it's really competitive. Higher ed is extremely competitive and the number of students is gonna be decreasing over the coming decade. There's just not that many humans available to attend college because the generation is a bit smaller. So there are also you know, opportunities to partner with high schools. So we share information with 
um, our collegiate partners to say, here's some facts and figures around our industry. And then Tyler and others in their gamma chapters may end up at a high school talking with high school students or sharing that information with a high school teacher who happens to perhaps teach a, a finance class. So those decisions as they're being made, it's how do we share our information? How do we tell our stories? How do we just talk about something that maybe we've not talked about for a very long time? to uh, really share some, some of the facts as, as Jeremy did when we were starting out about the opportunities that, that exist. Um, and I loved Nicole, when you were sharing that you've actually, the youngest person that you've hired was someone who was a senior in high school, also doing collegiate courseware and, and combining the two and hey, they're, they're perfectly eligible and very qualified for the internship role that, that you were looking to fill. I know we're coming up on uh, the last 15 minutes or so here, so I wanna be respectful of everybody's time this morning. Um, but Jeremy, there was a question that was posed um, talking about kind of the strategic element of being a licensed agent. And if I'm a young person starting to build a book of business and starting out in an agency, would, would you recommend primarily focusing on developing your in-state sales or your in-state business? Or do you think it's better to focus outside of the state and, and maybe more broadly? Just your opinion, your thought, how do you, how do you start to do that? Um, yeah, so I got my Ohio um, resident PNC license um, about a, a couple months ago. And um, I'm, I'm working for Berkeley part-time or for, for the agency part-time and full-time student. So it's difficult to start building my own book of business now, but funny enough, um, I, I'm actually have the opportunity um, and my dad's helping me on this because he does the commercial at my family agency where it's a business in um, New York. So it's a foreign, my first piece of business might be a foreign piece of business. So that's the funny part. I How I would start off is by saying that I would start domestically and I would build up my book and um, when I have enough to sustain myself, then I would go out and build, build my bandwidth across the nation. And you also have to, have to take into account, you know, for every state that you go into, you have to get a non-resident license and you have to pay for that each year. So if you don't have enough business in that state to sustain that cost, albeit it is a, I believe it's a small cost, um, then it's not worth your time. And in, in, in state, there's also a cost. So it, it, it just makes sense that you would start domestically and building up your, your clientele by um, friends, family, who you know. And then once that has settled, you know, you'll get someone that moves out of town that may move to Florida or move to Chicago and um, they may refer some business to you. And then you might say, okay, um, my, my book is growing a bit in Chicago. I, I may consider um, opening a second office there or focusing more and putting, um, you know, throwing some ads there online and seeing what comes out of it. But um, it's cool. So my, my family agency is licensed in 43 states in DC. So we have business all over the place. And it's, and it's fun to see when different types of business come in from Florida, from New York, from Chicago, from Kentucky, from Indiana. It's because it's, every state is different Could because every state's Department of Insurance runs it. So, um, and that's a very heavy topic is if it should be federally or state mandated. And it's been state mandated since I want to say 1945, I think it was McCarran-Ferguson Act or the McCarran-Ferguson case, but um, it's, uh, to keep it short, I would, I would start domestic. And then when I get that book good um, and sustainable, then I would go to foreign sales. Thanks for that, Jeremy, I appreciate it. Um, and sometimes too, it's um, it strategically as important to be identifying the sector or the vertical that you wanna be working within. You know, is it contractors, is it manufacturers, is it distributors, is it personal lines, is it commercial lines? It's those types of things. And then, you know, taking it, th those next steps as you described. So thank you so much for that. So I'm gonna pose our final question to the three of you. And it's kind of a twofold question. It's pretty reflective on, on where we've been the last couple of years and where we're going as we, as we look forward. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of insurance? What do you think it looks like? And then the all important, what does work from home look like going forward? So I, need, I know I keep saying opportunity, but I think it's a, 
it, it's exciting where the future is going. I mean, um, kind of like we talked about with jobs we won't know that are going to going to exist in five to ten years. I mean, the growth is is huge, and that's not going to change. Um, work from home, I think it's what what we're going to make it. I mean, if companies start requiring everyone to come in and that and there's pushback on that, I think a hybrid um, approach is going to be where we're at. I mean. People like me, I sometimes get bored and lonely in my apartment by myself, so I may want to go in two days a week. But I mean, it all balances. It all depends on where you're at in life. If you have kids at home, if you, I mean, wherever you want, I think companies are going to have to be flexible if they want to retain, if they want to even um, look into getting new, new talent as well. So I think it's unknown but at the same time what we make it. And it's exciting that it's not going to be just um, one way uh, moving forward. Great, thanks, Tyler. Jeremy or Nicole? Um, yeah, I could touch on it next. Um, as we said before, it's ever changing and there's going to be numerous coverage changes and new companies coming out of the blue, um, like the, the, the Lemonades, the Hippos of the world, um, the InsureTech. Um, but I, I saw a post on LinkedIn the other day where it said that the 40 hour work week is not what it used to be. And I read through the post and it said that, you know, 30 years ago in the insurance industry, you worked from nine to five, you went home and most likely, more likely than not, you were, you were done for the day because you weren't getting any emails. You know, you might get the occasional phone call if you're an agent for a claim, if someone got into an accident, but for the most part, you were done. Today, I get emails at six, seven, eight, nine, midnight, one o'clock in the morning of agent or of clients needing an ID card, needing a uh, an, a deck page for closing. Um, they have a question that popped into their head while they were trying to go to sleep. But it it today it, it doesn't stop, and that's what I like most about it is that I, I on the agency side is that we are here for you twenty four seven. You know, call call my phone at seven, call my phone at ten at night. I'll, I'll pick up that I have no problem doing. So that's what I like to do. Um, I take after my dad. If, if, if you send my dad an email at five in the morning, he'll answer you at five Oh one in the morning, always on it, always there helping out clients. And um, I'll say that to end it, that just as you go to your um, accountant for your taxes, you should be going to an insurance agent for your insurance because they know what's best for you. They know what coverages you need. Um, they're, they're seasoned. They, they, they took courses. This industry is the most detailed industry that I've ever even looked at. It's impossible to know everything. So having an agent by your side and, and, and um, representing you in your family's future, current and, and future assets is um, the, the biggest thing. So Jeremy, you definitely try to get some kind of work-life balance because that's actually probably the biggest challenge we're experiencing as an organization is we just rolled out a new culture playbook and ensuring when we're setting up meetings that we're giving people time in between meetings to you know have a little bit of downtime and breaks and Fridays, no meeting days, um, things like that. Because that's, I will say, even though there's been a huge benefit to you know, much most of our workforce working remote. There's also that inability sometimes to separate work and home, right? Because you're not physically leaving a building now. Um, you know, it's all together. So we really we had plans for state expansion, which we're pausing until we can get this culture playbook out and making sure that our workforce is you know having that work life balance. The great part is. When you love what you're doing, you know you're valued and appreciated and satisfied with your role, you tend to do more, right? But at the same time, we have to find that balance. Um, I will tell you, almost any position in our organization can be fully remote if the individual chooses to do that. Um, almost every position I post lists either hybrid or remote opportunities what I'm hearing from candidates, though, unless they are required to relocation, most people truly refer or prefer that hybrid approach. So they are having some of that interaction with their teams. Um, so right now, probably until the end of the year, we're still going to be majority remote regardless. And then we'll kind of, you know, really probably more like next year, start saying, okay, 
if we want to, on a regular basis, have these teams come in, you know, one or two times a week, you know, these are kind of the days that they've identified. Even our senior leaders, they come in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then they work remote fully the rest of the time. So um, I will say it's been great from a recruiting aspect. It really has allowed us to expand much outside of our typical network, um, and particularly in technology. Um, in the past, technology for insurance, sometimes it was hard for us to attract talent because, again, um, in the technology space, people didn't see insurance as being that real exciting kind of sexy industry, right? And then we also didn't, you know, have the competitive, um, like, you know, the casual or work from home and so forth. Um, so that's really been a huge benefit for us as well. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I think if we reflect on our industry and when we started out, I know uh, Jeremy made mention of, you know, the, the age of our industry and the fact we've been around since, you know, the 1600s in some form or another. Um, I think the industry, if we reflect on the past two years in the pandemic, we've probably grown more in the last two years than maybe in the last decade. Um, the industry came through very, very well um, in the pandemic um, in terms of new positions, new roles, new opportunities in terms of profit and growth and things of that nature. Um, and, and I think we also came through with you know, shining gold stars in terms of our adaptability. We turned on a dime and all went and worked from home. Um, and, and we found new ways to do things. And we became very open to remote work and we became open to a hybrid model. Um, we probably have interns and early career folks joining our industry that we wouldn't have even considered had we not had the need to, to do things differently and in a different way. So I think that's exciting to watch our industry do that. We may reflect on the past two years, a decade down the road, and say, wow, if some of that hadn't happened, we wouldn't have grown as much as we have to get to the point that we're at um, 10, years, 10 years down the road. So with that, I'm going to be respectful of everybody's time and our time commitment for the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, a huge thank you to Jeremy, Tyler, and Nicole for participating as our panelists. And we'll look, look forward to the, the next webinar here down the road um, to be shared with students and faculty, industry members, and uh, just keep talking about this fabulous industry and, and all of our experiences. So thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks for hosting and all your guys' efforts. Thank you, Amanda and Connie. That was fantastic. And you're very welcome. Well, thank Thanks you for joining so us. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that we'll uh, we'll be in touch soon. But um, not have a great week. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Hey guys, have a good one. Thank you so Take much. Take care, Tyler. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yes, for sure.